It's time for Football at Four with 97.3 ESPN.com's Andrew DeCecco. My first allegiance is what will be best for the Philadelphia Eagles and our fans for the next three, four, five years. Powered by the Inside the Birds podcast. Now, live from inside the Matt Black Kia Studios, it's Football at Four. Football at Four is powered by the Inside the Birds podcast, and it is brought to you this hour by PropSwap, America's sports betting marketplace. Sell your sports bets and take your profit. Find out how at PropSwap.com or download the PropSwap app today. I am Mike Gill. Andrew DeCecco rides shotgun with me during Tuesday's edition of Football at Four. We will uh, examine quarterbacks in the NFL. There's a lot of quarterback stories going on. I want to get Andrew's opinion on a bunch of this stuff as uh, we always talk football 4 o'clock right here on the Sports Match on 97.3 ESPN. So let's bring him in from inside the birds, Andrew DeCecco, as he joins us now on the Boardwalk Honda Hotline. Andrew, what's up, my man? Hey, Mike, doing well. How are you? All right, brother. And, uh, of course, uh, get your opinion. Uh, yesterday, the Eagles made a signing. They added a quarterback to their quarterback room. And a lot of people, uh, you know, looking at Nick Mullins, solid number three quarterback here. And, obviously, the Eagles, we talked about it last time you were on. Do they go down the road of uh, getting, like, an undrafted rookie free agent and try to work with him? Or do they go get a more veteran guy? Well, they didn't only get a veteran guy. They got a guy who was started 16 games in the NFL, uh, so he's got some pretty good experience. Yeah, I mean, uh, Nick Mullins, he started 16 games in the NFL, played 19 of them, 26 years old, um, averages just under 250 yards passing in the games that he started in. Doesn't really, I think it's seven, yeah, I think he averaged seven yards per pass attempt. So, I mean, he's, he's not a guy that's going to push the ball down the field. His arm's very mediocre, but he's very, very well-versed in the West Coast offense, and I think ultimately one of the biggest winners out of this, uh, out of that signing are those back end of the receivers vying for roster spots, right? Because when you look at the past preseasons, whether it's been Dane Evans or Matt McGloin or Christian Hackenberg, I mean, a lot of these receivers, whether it's Greg Ward, Rashard Davis, or, or, or Bryce Treggs or whomever it was in past years that were kind of on the outside looking in for a roster spot, I mean, they were sort of at the mercy of the third or fourth string quarterback in those games. And they were very, uh, very much off the mark where they didn't say that they were missing wide open guys. And a lot of times, you know, if you're a receiver trying to get a latch on to a roster, I mean, that's your audition. You may not make the, that football team, but you may be trying to audition for somebody else. And now you have a quarterback that's played a number of games and has that experience. I'm glad you brought that up. I brought that up with Jeff yesterday is that, you know, that also helps not only the quarterback room, but the development of the John Hightowers, the Quez Watkins, the guys who, you know, hey, the quarterback that I'm working with isn't really hitting me where I need to be hit. Mullins, at least you have a guy who has started 16 games and had a fair level of, you know, uh, of experience. That could only not only help the quarterback room, but also help those back end receiver guys. I thought that that's a very smart, um, you know, uh, observation that you make there. Yeah, and and that's that's one of those those underlying things that a lot of people may not realize when they're assessing the preseason. But a lot of these receivers can play, but the, and, and everybody wants a young quarterback to, to sort of develop. But a lot of times, those are the growing pains in the preseason. The, these young quarterbacks go through, and they don't necessarily go through their progressions. They don't see guys that are open. Uh, they overthrow guys, you know, and all of a sudden these drives stall, and you're not, and these receivers aren't able to put their best film on. Uh, put their best stuff on film, and a lot of times they end up on the practice squads, or they may not get a second chance. So, I mean, I think that's a very, uh, a very key signing here to kind of get better play in the in the latter stages of the preseason. All right. So, let me ask you this: Is he here to be the number three? Is he here? You know, Nick Sirianni, he uh, pre- um, competition, competition, competition. I don't think anybody thinks he's going to be the starting quarterback here. Uh, but uh, is the pressure on anybody here, or is this just, hey, a smart third guy uh, that will just help out the quarterback room? Well, if, if we're to believe Nick Sirianni, he's preached competition from the moment he, his, his moment he got here. Essentially, his opening press conference, he definitely stressed that. So I think that that's something that is going, it's going to be a competition. Look, Joe Flacco is a long ways away from his days in Baltimore where he, he was uh, you know, making, those, making those throws healthy, First and foremost, he hasn't been healthy, and he really, we really haven't seen much of Joe Flacco. Obviously, he has a much more extensive and gaudy resume when 
stack up against the 26-year-old Nick Mullins, but there's going to be competition there. Do I think that Nick Mullins has anywhere close to the physical attributes of a Joe Flacco? No. Flacco has got one, still has one of the strongest arms in the NFL, and I ultimately think that he will be the, the second quarterback, but he's not, he's not just going to hand him this job. Like anybody else, he's going to have to compete uh, for his roster from his for his spot on the depth chart. Yeah, you know, and that's another thing. You know, when I look at a guy like him, you know, if you have to play him for eight, ten games, yeah, your season's probably going to go sideways a little bit. But it's I, I, I said this to most yesterday, which if you it's not like Ben Denucci coming in where he has to play one game that you essentially have no shot to win that game, or you have to game plan completely around the fact that you have very poor quarterback play. He can go win you a game or two if you need him for that. Uh, and that's where I find positives in moves like this is, but, and that also kind of tells me, I go back to this, uh, Andrew, the message from the Eagles seems to be that they think they have a shot in this. That's why you make signings like Richard Rogers and Nick Mullins. Yeah. I think a signing like that certainly tells you that they want to make sure that they're bringing, they're bringing in the best possible depth to support whatever position it may be, add competition everywhere. And, yeah, you're right. When you look at Nick Mullins, is he a guy that's going to win you six, seven, eight games if he, had, if he had to start for a number of games? No. Like for, if, you know, one, two, maybe three if he had to step in? Yeah, because what he lacks in physical, uh, physical attributes, the, the, the rocket arm, the ability to move outside the pocket, he makes up for with his poise, his, his ball placement, his accuracy. And, and just his timing throws, which is essential to the West Coast offense. So there's a lot of things that he does well. I think that he could step in for a game or two and give them uh, pretty pretty high quality plays. Like yeah. you said, it's not like a Ben DiNucci. Uh <laughs> This guy's been around for a little bit. He's still tw- he's still just 26 years old. We'll be interested to see how he adapts to the Eagles' offensive system. But yeah, it, it was a great value. It's a great signing first and foremost. And then we're going to see how he sort of battles with Joe Flacco this summer. Like I said, I think Joe Flacco is ultimately going to be the second quarterback. But we'll see how we'll see how everything plays out. Yeah, and I know that um, you know, a lot of people uh, you know, you look around the league and you look for a number 3 as you mentioned before. It's a lot of unproven guys. The Eagles uh, we know they value that position. We heard what they said about the quarterback factory. I'm sure they regret that, but bringing in a guy like Mullins uh, certainly gives them another veteran guy in that quarterback room. All right, Andrew to check this with us. We want to kind of focus on quarterbacks today. One of the quarterback stories is in Chicago where Matt Nagy came out today, Andrew, and said, we're going to stick with Andy Dalton. Justin Fields is number two. He essentially said, there's no way, there's nothing that Justin Fields could do to win that starting job. Uh, so do you agree with what Maggie's, Nagy's kind of message is? You know, if <laughs> if – uh, Nick Sirianni came out and said Hertz is the guy. I think people would like that. So do we like Nagy saying that Dalton's the guy? Well, he's right now he's standing by his veteran quarterback, and he, there's a lot of ways you can look at this, right? I mean, he could just be trying to light a fire under Justin uh, Justin Field by saying, "Listen, man, you know, maybe maybe it lights a fi- sparks a fire, and he wants to go out and prove him wrong that he should seize that job, and that that and he's going to go out and earn that with a and." with a lights out training camp or it could just be him not wanting to necessarily throw his rookie quarterback into the fire when the roster around him isn't necessarily the best uh, the, for him to get off to a successful start in the NFL. Right. I mean, Andy Dalton is a good veteran to sort of direct that offense. He's not really going to elevate it per se, but he may be a guy that can sort of navigate things while Justin Fields sort of gets, finds his footing in the NFL you don't necessarily want to stunt a rookie quarterback's growth by throwing him out into the deep end if he's not necessarily ready. So that that could be one message. But you know, I, I, I would Justin Fields. That was very high, or Justin Fields. I was very high on him coming into the draft. I had him as my second rated quarterback. Wouldn't surprise me if he makes the decision very tough this summer. And um, that's a good thing for Chicago. I mean, he has all the tools. I just don't know if they want to throw him in the deep end right away. Right. I mean, sight unseen. Um, and we all know what Andy Dalton is. Uh, do the Chicago, like the Chicago Bears made the playoffs last year, man. I mean, you're thinking to yourself, mm-hmm. who gives them a better shot to grow uh, from where they were last year to this year? And is Andy Dalton that guy? I mean, it's not like Dalton has been – he's not the Andy Dalton that played for the Cincinnati Bengals. Yeah, well, right at this point of his career, he's just a stabilizing veteran presence. He, Like I said, he's not going to give you these dynamic plays, these explosive plays. He's going to keep you in, in games – 
then there's going to he's a streaky player, right? So there's going to be those games where he just can't get anything going uh, offensively. And he, he, at this point in Andy Dalton's career, he's in his early 30s. I think he might be 32 or 33 years old. You kind of know what you have in him. Maybe your best hope is just to get get things off to a you know a decent start and and hope that he can keep you in playoff contention. But um, if this thing goes south, which it certainly can. I mean, certainly Andy Dalton's not a player that's going to elevate an offense. I mean, I, I think that there could be a, they're going to have to turn it over. There could be a point in the season when they have to turn it over to Justin Fields. Right. All right. Uh, how about in Washington, Andrew, where Ron Rivera is saying quarterback competition. Uh, he's got Ryan Fitzpatrick. I think everybody just assumes that he wins the job. Uh, Haskins is gone, but Tyler Henneke is there. So Fitzpatrick, Taylor Henneke, how do you see that kind of working out for the Washington football team? Yeah, I mean, uh, Taylor Heineke, that was a great story at the end of the last season. I don't know if he can consistently go out there and give you that sort of production. I think it was more of a product of the the team not really knowing how to how to defend him. There's not that there wasn't a whole lot of tape on him, and he was just more of that undersized, scrappy quarterback that found ways to make plays. And the defense really just didn't have an answer for him. There's not, like I said, there's not a lot of game tape out there. But now, if there is. You're gonna, I think you're going to see a vastly different player. Now, and, the, and Ryan Fitzpatrick, he's just your typical journeyman that plays well in spurts, hasn't necessarily put anything – obviously he hasn't put it all together and been consistent enough for a team to kind of commit to him long term. Um, he's proven that if you throw him into a team, he can kind of invigorate a little life. He has a, a good personality. He's a smart guy and can sort of lead an offense. But, I mean, not for not, he's not a long-term option. I, they really need to – I don't think either of those guys, to answer your question, are long-term options. But I think this season, it's going to be Ryan Fitzpatrick. All right. Do you think that they are a, uh, I don't want to say outside or a long shot, but in the money, in the running to uh, make a deal for Aaron Rodgers? Uh, I think it's a long shot. But I think when you're when you when you face any kind of question about your quarterback and you have uh, ammo to do so. You're always you're going to be in the conversation to get a quarterback like Aaron Rodgers because Aaron, Aaron Rodgers is the best quarterback in football. Yeah, I know that uh, that would really change the dynamics of the NFC East. There, let me ask you about the NFC East and Daniel Jones. You know, I was reading something the other day about teams that did not make the playoffs last year and teams that could get back in. Two were in the NFC East. One was Dallas. The other was the Giants. I like what the Giants have done this season. But does Daniel Jones ultimately hold them back? Yeah, I think so. He really didn't see that jump in, in his game last season. In fact, he sort of saw a regression, and he's just not consistent enough. to. The, the Giants aren't good enough offensively to overcome their lackluster play at quarterback. That's just It doesn't matter that you're getting Saquon back and everything else. He is their offense. Right, I mean, when you take a quarterback high like the Giants did in Daniel Jones, you're expecting him to be a lot further along than where he is currently. And now, all of a sudden, you're looking at a, at a liability at the quarterback position, and they have to sort of scheme around his deficiencies. The light just hasn't come on for him, and I think that he's easily the, the worst quarterback in the NFC. All right, uh, I like to hear that, uh, and I think a lot of people may agree with you. Uh, of course, we don't know much about Jalen Hurts and where he kind of is. What about in New England, where Cam Newton came out and said Mac Jones was the right pick? He was the best player available, so he's certainly approaching this differently than other quarterbacks. Uh, have when their team drafted a first round pick there. So in New England, who do you anticipate? Newton or Jones? Uh, that's an easy one for me. It's, it's going to be Cam Newton. I think that Cam's going to rebound this season. Do I think he'll ever return to the, the Carolina Panthers in his prime, Cam Newton? Probably not. But I, I, I think that he's going to give the offense a lot more juice than Matt Jones can at this point and, and being a rookie. And I never saw him as a viable uh, contender to be uh, the third quarterback or the third overall pick. I just thought he had a lot longer uh, – steeper learning curve than some of those other guys. So I don't anticipate him being a factor this summer, and I think Cam Newton should kind of win that job running away. Uh, if Cam Newton is the quarterback there, they did not make the playoffs last year. Are they a playoff team with him or Mac Jones this year? Well, with the healthy Cam Newton, I think that they can squeak into the playoffs. I don't think that Cam Newton 
like I said, there's, there's, he's been banged up over the years, and you started to see those injuries take a toll on his overall game. But I think if you scheme around what he's able to do really well and play to his strengths, I think that you can get, you can muster out some offense there. Now the receiving court they had last season was abysmal, and they need to surround him with better pieces as well because I felt too often that Cam Newton was trying to do it all himself and. He just isn't that kind of player right now. But I think if, if the pieces are in place, I think they can be a team that squeaks into the playoffs with him under center. All right. We are uh, kind of looking at quarterbacks around the league. There's a lot of OTAs uh, going on these last couple of weeks, and we're starting to see the beginning of them. Another one is in Denver. like to hear your take on Drew Locke against Teddy Bridgewater in Denver. Uh, Drew Locke's going to go in there, obviously being the favorite. Teddy Bridgewater, there are a lot – they're very similar if you look at what they accomplished in the NFL. Drew, Drew Locke is someone that he had very high hopes, just like Teddy Bridgewater did when he was coming into the NFL. But they almost have somewhat of a game manager element to their game. I mean, Teddy, Teddy Bridgewater, certainly at this point, you know exactly what he is. Drew Locke, when, with all the pieces around him, they, they, Denver should have one of the strongest offenses in football. There's no reason not to. And it, much like with the Giants, I thought that Drew Locke held them back last season. Never didn't take the step forward that many thought, including myself, that that was going to happen. Um, I mean, I, I think Teddy Bridgewater is a safer option. I think that he can sort of navigate that offense, direct them, lead them to a handful of wins. They have their defense is strong enough to keep them in playoff contention, but I, I'm not sort of enamored with either option, to be honest with you. All right. Uh, I guess another battle. This is fun. There's a lot of them going on. And uh, this is very fluid. What happens in New Orleans? Uh, Jameis Winston, Taysom Hill. Uh, how do you kind of see that one going in the training camp? Yeah, that's a that's a that's a brutal <laughs> that's a brutal <laughs> duo there. I mean, I think I would. I think the the right thing would be to go with Jameis Winston. He's a traditional quarterback. He has an arm. He's. I mean, he he knows that he can throw touchdowns, but along along with that, he also takes a lot of chances. Doesn't necessarily see the field well at this stage of his career, which is a little alarming. Um, so he's going to turn the football over quite a bit, but he can throw the football far better than anything that Taysom Hill has ever shown or can do right now. Taysom Hill is a more dynamic option, and I th- but I think he's better uh, better utilized as more of a gadget player throw him in for a handful of plays a game. If he has to st- sit back there and drop back, the Saints are going to be very easy to defend. Uh, I look forward to a lot of these, and I guess uh, if you look around the league, they are the biggest ones. you got Chicago, as we mentioned, uh, with the rookie out there. You've got the New Orleans situation that we touched on. Denver, uh, Houston, I guess, is another one. We have no idea what's going to happen in Houston. I guess if um, Deshaun Watson – do you anticipate Deshaun Watson playing this year? Um, I, I I do I do I I think he's going to end, ultimately end up playing. I think it's going to be more of a less. It's going to come down on the wire, but I, I think he suits up this season. Because I guess then you would have Tyrod Taylor, right? Would be the uh, the your other option. Yeah. Yep. All right. So there's a uh, I guess a possibility out there. So we're kind of looking through. We got all of the uh, you know the pretty uh, high profile. Uh, quarterback competitions going on, and uh, one of them in Washington, as we mentioned, one in Chicago. Uh, I guess there is the the one in New Orleans. You've got one in Denver, Houston, possible with what's going on out there, and uh, and New England, which you think that will be um, Cam Newton. So there you go. There's a little bit look of what's going on. I guess Miami's interesting too. If they end up making a trade, I don't know how much they uh, how much faith they had in Tua after the first year there. Yeah, it didn't seem. It seemed like they were a little hesitant to anoint him as a long-term starter. Tua doesn't have a strong arm. He he showed. I mean, he's very he's very frail. If you look at him, you wonder if he's going to be able to withstand the the rigors that come with playing that quarterback position. If he's going to be able. They built the. They have a lot of pieces around. They built up that offensive line the right way. I just don't know if he's going to be that guy that can sort of make the most and, and capitalize on, on the pieces that are there. I think that they need a, he's a little bit undersized, not a strong arm, not, I think that there, he, they, he showed some things last season that kind of caused a little, uh, a little cause for concern. So, I mean, I think they would be in the running to add a quarterback too, although it would have to be somebody of the caliber of an Aaron Rodgers, of course. 
I think that given their investment in Tua, it would have to be pretty. It would have to be a substantial upgrade. Definitely something to keep an eye on. I, I got to say, when uh, Tua was coming out, I was not. I don't want to say I was a hater or anything. I just, I didn't think he was going to be a tank for Tua. I didn't think it would be very worth it. Um, I don't think he right. was changing a franchise. Uh, and so far, that seems to be the case. All right, uh, Andrew Checo, football at four. There you go. We'll be taking a look uh, throughout the offseason at different storylines, and uh, we'll start breaking down some of the divisions and get thoughts on all that and more. Uh, Andrew Checo, InsideTheBirds.com, and he, like August, appeared via the Boardwalk Honda Hotline for today's edition of Football at Four. Thanks, Andrew. Yeah, man, have a good one. You do the same. That was good conversation.